saw like the, the the product was so bad, you know. I was like, wow. I mean, I could grow this in my house and just bring it to the restaurant and maybe get a little extra money out of it. So that's why I started. You know. Welcome to the Mike Green's Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Jonah Krakmalnik. Together, we'll explore the art of turning tiny seeds into a thriving microgreens empire, sharing insights, coveted secrets, and strategic wisdom from building one of Canada's largest microgreens farms. Stay tuned for thought-provoking conversations with leading figures in the world of microgreens. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. On today's episode, we have Charlie Perez from Charlie's Microgreens in Miami, Florida, Charlie has a small but mighty microgreens farm that is producing 96 trays per week in just 50 square feet of space. This has to be the most dense growing space I've ever heard to date. We delve into the lifestyle of working for yourself as a microgreens business owner, growing challenges and suggestions for cilantro microgreens, making the choice to stay a smaller operation and still be highly profitable, and so much more. Let's get right into it. Hey, Charlie. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's great to have you on. And yeah, thanks. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. That's uh, this is a great opportunity to be here and uh, share my experience with you. Because I know a lot of people are going to listen and they're going to take some advice. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it's great. It's always great to be able to talk to microgreens business owners and just like share the wealth of knowledge that you have with other farms. And and more, even more importantly, I think people that may not be microgreens farmers yet but are interested in it to hear farmers' experiences because like. I think there's such a varied experience of what it's like to run a microgreens business. So I'd love to hear how you first got interested in microgreens and the backstory of how your farm, Charlie's Microgreens, came to be. Okay, so I used to work in restaurants. I worked in restaurants for over 10 years. And before COVID hit, I was just trying to find a way to get out of the business. And I always, I always liked gardening. I liked plants. It was something that came from my family. So one day I, I was planting some arugula and I saw in a three day period it sprouted and I was like, whoa, those are, those are microgreens, right? So, you know, I started looking into it and it, there's a whole business out there. There's a whole YouTube channels and stuff like that. So I was like, oh man, maybe we could do something with this. Um, I had a little extra space and that's, you know, what we started doing. We started working towards like learning about it and the pandemic hit right away you know it was right in 2020 when i we started thinking about doing this um, so i you know everything was closed everything was shut down the only thing i could do was learn so i started growing a couple of trays here and there and giving them away to my neighbors um you know posting it on facebook and you know random places like this this app called next door and it's mm. just the neighborhood app so I started there, then I reached out to some of my chef friends and they helped me out. They started receiving some of the microgreens that I was growing. And then they started giving me feedback on how to, you know, maybe cut a little, a little bit more or um, get it a little bigger. So I started, you know, doing everything for free. I wasn't getting paid for this at all. And after seven months that everything started getting back into place, that's when I started actually uh, getting some revenue from the microgreens, but I was like very concerned because it took a lot of space. It, you know, it, it just, there was so much to it. And, and, um, uh, but once I saw the numbers and every month we were growing, I was like, okay, we, we could do this. We can definitely do this. And one of the things that uh, motivated me was to be able to not work for somebody and work for myself. And I always thought, you know, I have three girls. And the reason my logo is the way it is, if you see my logo, it's uh, it's like a sun. And then there's a coral in the middle. It's a, it looks like a tree, but it's actually a coral. Yeah, I thought it was a tree. It's a green coral. So my first daughter's name is Coral, which is coral. And then the second one is Sol, which is sun. And then it, it, it has like little stripes and it's, it's, it's supposed to resemble dawn. And my third daughter's name is Alba, which means Don in Spanish. Mm -hmm. you know? So everything kind of came together as a family. And that's like one of the most important things for us. So that's how our farm came to be. You know? we, I have another that, business on the side, but this is like our main thing. With Charlie that's Mike amazing. Pierce. Yeah. I love the intentionality with, with the, the logo and the, and the backstory in, in the business. I've noticed that a lot of, uh, not, I understand a lot, but like there is a good sub segment of, 
Mike Green's farmers that started out in food service and then saw like kind of an opportunity there because when you're working in a specific industry, you kind of get a sense of what doesn't work well, what does work well, where there's opportunity. So because obviously the restaurant industry is so big, maybe that's why there's so many people working there, but it's also makes it like a lot easier to know what to sell, how to sell to that Definitely. industry when you, when you work behind the scenes in that industry. So it's the same thing. Like if you were working at a grocery store, you'd have a much better sense of like how to sell to a grocery store because you talk to the produce manager and you're like interacting with them often. And that you hear about how there's all the quality issues and qualities, like something that's really important to have consistency or whatever it may be. And then you take that information and put in your business. So it's cool to see that you've kind of done that transition yeah, definitely. And it's, and I, I i saw like the, the the product was so bad you know i was like whoa i mean i could grow this in my house and just bring it to the restaurant and maybe get a little extra money out of it so that's why i started you know and it definitely that's amazing. It, it, it's a good sell point you know if you if you tell them oh you know my your microgreens are fresher than anything that you can possibly get you know they're cut and deliver the next day so yeah you can't beat that you can't beat that yeah, for sure. And you're you're in. Are you in Miami itself? Yeah, I'm in Miami itself. Okay, and then like most right, of the right next to downtown Miami. I have oh, wow. a couple. I have a couple Michelin star restaurants. Um, I have some in Miami Beach and and Wingwood. And yeah, man, we're, we're we have you know one small distributor, and yeah, we're working little by little, but it's going. It's going. Amazing. Yeah, and, and it's great that you've been able to transition to make this like your full time thing. I think that's a lot of people's dreams starting out is to like get away from you know corporate nine to five and mm -hmm. and be able to work for yourself and set your own hours and you know especially with having three kids and and you know everything uh, that it takes to to raise kids plus running the business, you get a lot more flexibility yeah. when you're running a business than working. So it, it just makes it. Uh, Easier in some ways, uh, but it's the I think the lifestyle that a lot of people really want when they get into my greens. It's not just like okay, growing greens, which I think is a big reason. Like I started, it wasn't necessarily a lifestyle thing, mm -hmm. uh, but I think a lot of people really like having the flexibility and the lifestyle of running your own business than having to go uh, specific hours to to, to work somewhere, uh, especially if you don't necessarily really like the job that much yeah I, I could definitely do anything else you know uh, so as far as as long as i don't have to work for somebody i think we're we're on that line we're, we're not yeah. working for anybody anymore you know it's like yeah that's it doesn't matter what it is yeah 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 there's 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 definitely a, a, a nice sense of freedom uh, however you do work for your customers so it's just like a different i think it's like a different way like you're working a relationship uh, yeah, more relationship, more collaboration rather than like someone tells you what to do and you have to do it even if it doesn't make sense. Like that's kind of eliminated when when you work for yourself, which is really nice because there's a lot of inefficiency and just like wasted time in those kind of setups. Some sometimes, not always, but um, yeah. But uh, so so, do you sell exclusively to restaurants or do you also sell to other customer types? Uh, we got into the farmer's market a couple of years ago, and we were doing it every Sunday. It was good, um, but if people aren't as consistent to, as to buy microgreens like on, on a weekly basis. So I saw it was like one week it was good, one week it was so-so. So I, I started keeping it more to restaurants, but I'm, I'm open doors. Like anybody that wants to get a box of microgreens or you know, as long as they don't want it for like, like a next day kind of thing, you know, yeah, that's we can do that, you know. But yeah. we, we we try to focus on restaurants that are consistent and not that you know they're just trying things out and I just want one box every other week or you know we we want more of like a weekly basis customer, so we keep it to restaurants and I yeah. just started getting into distributors and that's that's pretty good. I think I I like it more because it's just one route, you know. And yeah, you know, you don't have to deal with so many customers. I yeah, have, no, I have no. uh, 12 restaurants in total. Oh, wow, and one distributor. Yeah. Nice, yeah. And we grow and in a nine by six space. Wow, nine yeah. by six. Yeah, that's yeah, it's like so it's like 50 feet. square 50 square feet, roughly. Yeah, wow. So how many how many trays are you growing per per week in that? that right that's now, even smaller. I wasn't expecting to be that small. Yeah, that's impressive. We, we are at capacity now. We grow um, ninety six trays a week, and we have no space for like you know the 
where people have like germination space and they have like blackout space. We don't have space yeah. for that. So whenever we harvest, the trays are coming in to to the light directly. Yeah. You know? So so my cycle is complete all the time. Like it, it's always going. You know? The lights are and, always and, on, pretty much. Yeah. And when I started, I, I was doing some weird stuff. So I was doing like twenty four hour cycle. So I was planting on Wednesdays. And I was doing 24-hour cycles. So it, I was planting on oh. Thursdays, right? Delivering on Thursdays as well. And then they were ready by Wednesdays to to get harvested. So I was growing on a seven-day cycle, 24 hours. So I was cycling everything weekly in seven yeah. days. But it yeah. wasn't going that well. I noticed that the plants needed the night cycle. So. Yeah. We kind of switched it to to what it is now. Now they get a night cycle, and the shortest time is nine days for for the harvest. Okay, okay. yeah, is it, that includes germination. That includes germination, correct? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I, I saw on your um, on your Instagram that you guys are growing some unique varieties of, of microgreens. I'm not sure uh, if you're if you're growing them consistently or not. Um, yeah. But I saw like a, I can't remember what it's called. It's like it looks like a clover leaf. It's like oxalic. Uh, Oxalis, uh, yeah. We grow yeah, them yeah. yeah, we grow yeah. them out, outside and we ah. grow them for one of our Michigan star restaurants and they just order a box every week. And right now they're not using. Granita. Yeah. So he's mixing it what in a that? blender and uh, using it. And then I guess it's making like a like an ice cream kind of thing, like uh, ice. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting right? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. 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 The, the the unique uses of microgreens that that chefs have yeah. is uh, is incredible. Yeah, I mean, I like was it, listening to uh, guy from Boston Microgreens, and I love the ideas of uh, pickling the the sturgeon leaves, yeah. and also the um, he did something more the the simple syrup that I thought was a great idea. Yeah, the syrup. That's a, I, yeah, yeah, no, he he was very creative, Martin, with uh, with the use. Yeah, I've never heard of anyone using it in those ways. I thought it was really cool. Still haven't tried it because I've been traveling a lot. But um, yeah, actually, so I many actually did try. Cool, I, I did try um, doing the simple sugar, but doing more like a more like a. Uh, since I I was a chef, I I did like a little sweet and and spicy kind of thing with the nasturtium leaves. Oh, okay, and I'm also doing. I'm also using the. You know how the nasturtiums, if you don't cut the flower. They start growing seeds. Yeah. But the, the seed is very tender. When it's young, yeah, I guess. Young. And you can buy you can yeah. buy it and it tastes like an asturgeon. And it's like incredible. Interesting. It's incredible. And I, I presented it to some of the chefs that I have and they actually like it. They're like, okay, so give it. Give it to me. How, how do we do this? I'm like, anyway, <laughs> you know, this is like a byproduct. Like I wasn't even thinking about doing this, you know. Yeah, so yeah. Now I have something else to think about in in, in that area. The yeah. surgeons. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, other one is uh, just from from out, my outdoor farming years is is radish pods. So young radish pods are actually quite delicious too. Before the seed fully develops, they have like mm -hmm. a, a nice flavor to them and a good texture. Again, that's another like yeah. longer term, not not really falling into the edible flowers slash microgreens yeah. category that point and then it takes a lot longer to grow but for people who have land and are working with chefs like these are great ways to provide like add-ons from, from from waste products that would normally like you let your your bet, better radishes go to seed now you have all these pods and now maybe these pods are actually worth more than the actual radish crop that you're growing or same thing with nasturtiums in, in that in that scenario yeah, it's very unique and nobody's gonna have it it's good yeah and chefs love that yeah. from what that's what i've I've learned from doing the podcast is shut, the more unique mm -hmm. and out of left field the idea is or, or, or product is, the more interested they seem to be because it, it makes them stand out from all the other chefs. They're creating, they create something unique yeah. with that product that doesn't really exist. So yeah, it's, it's important to understand these kind of aspects of like high end chefs and, and what they're kind of looking for in, in, you know, having something unique. So given that it sounds like majority of your, customer base is restaurants. What are your best selling uh, varieties or, or mixes that you grow? Uh, we sell a lot of uh, mustard. Um, we also sell the mix, which my mix has amaranth, broccoli, red cabbage, and radishes, rainbow radish. Then we also sell a lot of cilantro, 
to show you that I have a whole rack full of cilantro. So yeah, half, yeah. half of what we grow is cilantro. Because since it's yeah. a two-week crop, I have to have you know enough space for the cilantro. I, it wasn't always like that, like cilantro, because cilantro is very tricky. You know, and, and yeah. I always have trouble with cilantro. Even to this day, I think that I wouldn't say I'm 100% there. Would love to be, but yeah, it's not there. I don't know. For for anyone listening, I just released, uh, I think it was a few weeks ago, uh, a podcast episode. Very short. It was like less than 10 minutes, just with like all my tips and tricks that I've learned over the years and how to grow cilantro. So uh, for you or anyone else that's really like, you know, struggling to grow it, there's some really good tips okay. in there. Uh, that may help you with some of the challenges you're facing with uh, with cilantro because yeah, it's definitely one of the more difficult microgreen crops to. Uh, it, it, I think it's easy to grow, but it's hard to perfect. Yeah. Just there's a lot of potential issues with it from seed to mold to potential flavor, or yellowing of leaves, and yeah, yeah it, so it, and it getting enough to have yield. enough nutrients. It can be too wet, you know, when when you start the yeah. germination process, and then for some reason temperature affects that a lot. So. I've been germinating outside and getting good results, but it's 80 something in Miami. So we, we I germinate yeah. for like six days and then I bring it inside and, and I do like a top watering and that helps for some reason. But I don't know. Yeah. I know, I know cilantro is uh, sensitive to uh, like extreme, like extreme high temperatures during germination because um, we actually created like a unique niche here in Toronto because even though we're so far north, there's a couple months of the year that's really, really hot. Um, and there was uh, a couple years where a lot, a lot of the, you know, cilantro microgreens that are used for restaurants actually come from from greenhouses in this area. So it got so hot that the, the crop just wouldn't germinate. So all of a sudden, we just had like a boom in demand for cilantro microgreens because they no one could get mm. them um, because of the weather. So that's something that I think also in Florida, like you know, in the summer months. You just can't grow cilantro because it's too hot. So it gives you a unique advantage of having local product that's way high, way higher quality than anything that's going to come from, you know, uh, northern U.S. that's being shipped yeah. down there uh, or, or, you know, from California or whatever. So, yeah, there's, there's you know, always ways to create unique advantages within your specific climate zone. And sounds like cilantro might be one one for that with uh, in South Florida. Yeah, definitely. Cilantro is like number one here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah i get why i it, it's 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 yeah, amazing it's a great crop, it's a great yeah, crop and, and all the restaurants great. here there, there's a lot of latin flavors so mm -hmm. we use a lot of cilantro I'm, I'm from venezuela originally we don't use a lot of cilantro but i know mexicans use cilantro and all central america yeah. and, you know it it sounds like miami is like a whole you know yeah. everything so everybody is doing cilantro yeah, yeah, no, that's it's good though. It's I think it's it's cilantro, arugula, th those are some of my favorite crops just to consume myself. Yeah. So it's it's nice to be able to grow the crops that you like yourself because then you, when there's extra, you can you can consume it or make things with it. Like there's so many uses of cilantro, uh, not just like fresh, but you can process it into chutneys and and sauces yeah. and so many delicious things you can use it for, uh, which is great. Yeah. So you mentioned that you were doing a seven day crop cycle and you switch to, to nine day are you doing crops like cilantro in, in nine or nine days or are you doing like in, in i think you said two weeks yeah, two right weeks. so there yeah. it grows pretty fast uh, but i guess the germination is faster for me for some reason because i see people that are germinating for seven days I'm, i germinate for five and uh, yeah. after five days it, it's just it's good enough for me i, I feel like after five it, it starts becoming a problem you know if, if it's still stacked. Yeah. So after that, it just it. I, I think I'm at at twenty days with cilantro. For cilantro, yeah. Okay, okay. So yeah, I, th I think the reason you're getting five day germ is because you're running at warmer yeah. temperatures, which is kind of what what I, what I did. So most people end up with like six to seven, generally speaking, just because uh, if they're running at like you know seventy to seventy five, it's going to be slower than if you're at eighty Fahrenheit um, temperature wise. So yeah, that's that's good to hear that. Um, that you're getting good good germination at uh, at that temperature. Yeah, I mean, I I, um, I, and, I used to tr I was trying to germinate it inside the grow room, but, you know, have a six by nine space. Yeah, <laughs> the temperatures they get up to eighty, and then it drops like sixty nine at night. 
you know. Okay. So it's, okay. it's it, I don't do it like that. It's just that my AC is not really like automatic or something like that, and I have to do it manually. So I leave it just at sixty nine, and then at night it drops to sixty nine. So I don't okay. know if that. If, I think it maybe it's just the lights. The, the lights are giving off a lot. Yeah, of the heat. lights give a lot of heat in, uh, during the day. But I was wondering if like that drop in temperature at night will actually like cost more mold on the trays, you know. So in theory, pretty much like if you have, let's say it's 80 during the day and then it goes down to 69, if the humidity, if the, the, the moisture in the air stays, stays the same, then the relative humidity will increase and then potentially okay. there'll be more condensation on the crop. So like if, if the temperature is decreasing, that air holds less water. So that means the relative humidity is going to increase. So pretty much you would have to like dehumidify or remove more, that yeah. humid air uh, to, to to keep the same relative humidity as you get to a lower temperature. I mean, like 80 and 69, it's like, unless your humidity is really high, it should be okay. Like if you can keep it on the lower end, which I know is harder in Florida because uh, <laughs> it's just so humid. Yeah, like, yeah. It, it doesn't, in, it doesn't like, go below 45. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Yeah. 45 is, 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 is fine. But how, how high does it get? It, it gets high at night. It goes up to like 70. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So just airflow might be the best simple solution. Yeah. Just like get more airflow, move in the air at night to keep mm -hmm. it off the off the greens, and then that should that should help a lot with the, uh, the condensation. But I, I'm, I'm guessing based on where you're at now, if you're at full capacity, what is kind of like your plans for expansion? Are you planning to stay in your current space for a while, or are you planning to? So we like, we rent find more we space? rent where we, we live right now, and we're we're looking into options of buying a property. That will feed the the need of like growing the microgreens, but we're definitely trying to grow. Yeah. The owner of the property that we're at, he's super okay with us doing this, and he told me that he will be okay if I put like a big jet in the back and just expand. But Miami is very complicated with the permits, and they're very slow, you know. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to see. I want to keep it as it is now, so I can. Because we're we're making good income with it, we have actually leftover income um, thanks to this new customer, the new distributor that we have for the business. So I'm trying to find some grants that I can find in here in Miami Dade to possibly like you know build a bank and then expand a little bit more. But you know the rent is so high, I feel like if I don't make four times what I'm making now, it it wouldn't sustain the rent or uh, having employees. Because you, you're going to have to have employees once you scale up that way. You know? So yeah. I, I kind of want to keep yeah. it in a spot where maybe I have one employee and I'm able to take some time away from it and work on some other things, but also have it be my job. And I don't, I don't think I want to grow it to a scale where I'm like, maybe like, like you, you know, that you, you scaled up so, so hard and, and you did it so big that you were able to sell it for whatever you sold it for. And, and be okay with it. But I, I think I'm just going to keep it as a business, like a side business for me, and then try to build something yeah. else from it. Yeah, no, for sure. Like ev everyone's going to have a different need and want from their business. So there's no right answer in yeah. terms of like, you know, it has to be a certain size for, for you to, to make money or to feel that you have success with it. Like you can keep it and grow two trays a week and, and, and like love doing it. And that, you know, to me is much more valuable than like, making tons of money, but not enjoying what you're doing. So I think, you know, it, it's just a perspective shift on what success is uh, for you. And, and you just got to do what makes sense for, for yourself and your business and your family. The, the reason, you know, on my end, I expanded the, the business is like all, all the things I wanted to do with it was like to automate, uh, to kind of take away my time from the business required scaling up to do so because it needed the financial resources to be able to do these types of things. So it wasn't necessarily like uh, I wanted my farm to be this like large scale microgreens farm. It just to, to meet the goals that I had um, and what I defined as success, which was like not necessarily having to work uh, 40, 50, 60 hours a week in the business. I needed to get to certain points to be able to get it there. So that, and, and that doesn't mean that that's the right strategy. It's just the strategy that worked. Uh, yeah. So we're growing the 96 trays now and we're not getting, I mean, on an average, it's like $15 a tray. You know, but I have I have some that um, they raise the average up. So 
chives and you know sturgeons they they really raise that the average of price per tray so if we're able to shift into different trays instead of going like all cilantro or a lot of mustard that produces more then we don't even need to expand yeah. we just need to find other customers you know that will pay for for those exactly. varieties and that way our income is going to be a little bit higher with the same space you know? It's all about numbers. It's exactly. all about numbers. So if you if you're able to find good crops to sell, the pea shoots and the sunflowers, you, there's not a lot of people that buy them consistently. Here, for me at least, I haven't found some, but I know they produce a lot um, as far as weight goes. But it all depends what you can find in your area and try to find the best variety that fits the income that you want to have. You know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and also depends on your customer yeah. type. Is like. Restaurants are going to have a different segment of crops that are highest in demand than grocery stores or farmers markets or uh, direct to consumer. So it just depends on on that customer base. So like pea shoots are, are, are I find they're more in demand at lower end restaurants than higher end restaurants just because they're a lower cost item and they're so common. So like high end chefs don't necessarily want to use that as often as they would want to use like cilantro or basil or amaranth, uh, and then. Pea shoots are also more common in grocery stores because people know, like, like there's brand or consumer awareness of pea shoots, so then people know what to do with them. Whereas the same thing with broccoli, like broccoli is really not popular. I've never heard of anyone say that broccoli migraines are popular with chefs, no. uh, but they're really popular at um, uh, you know grocery stores. So yeah, so so depending on who your customers are, you can kind of shift that around. But maybe as an example, if pea shoots make sense to grow financially, but your current customer base doesn't have demand for them. Maybe trying to find restaurants that are more chain restaurants that you can do big volume and, and they're looking for like a low cost microgreen to, to make a garnish or salad with. That's like an option where you can still stay in the food service segment, but switch to uh, a higher value crop to keep yourself from having to expand to a larger space yeah. uh, so, and, and then also increase the profitability at the same time. So what's nice about microgreens is there's so many different sub segments in the production that you can like shift, uh, which is really nice. It's not like you're just growing wheatgrass or you're just growing pea shoots. And if there's demand, there's demand. If there's not, there's not. There's so many ways to maneuver it, um, which I think is really cool because then like, you know, uh, one is more interesting to run as a business. Like I always thought, you know, if, if you were just growing cilantro and that's all you grew, would you enjoy what you do as much as if you were growing cilantro and amaranth and all the other crops I you're mean, growing? If it were to germinate like or, like perfectly, <laughs> yes, I wouldn't mind. But it's a two-week crop, so you, you're always going to miss out yeah. on all, all the varieties that grow in nine days, you know? So it's, it's yeah. always worth it to look first for customers that will pay you for those crops than going all in for those crops that take two weeks, you know? I think it, I, that's the yeah. way I see it. I, I know a lot of people will tell me like, oh, but you have to dance with the rhythm of the music. You know, that that's a, something somebody said to me the other day. And I was like, but I decide what, what I want to do. You know, like I, if I don't want to grow cilantro because it's a pain, you know, like I don't, I don't want to do it. You know, plus I'm, I'm like losing seeds. I'm losing space. It takes more time. So no, let's just find something else. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, for sure. It's your business. Like at the end of the day, yeah. like for, first of all, like uh, that was the most like Miami thing is like go with, go with the you know like that, that was amazing. But um, yeah, like it's your business. So you want to take advice from people that are where you want to be, uh, not from people that are where you don't want to be. So if like someone's uh, a police officer and they're giving you advice on how to grow microgreens, like that, they 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 don't know about running a business. But, you know, if you're if you're getting advice from Lux or Mosey is a good example. He, generally, his advice is pretty good for business. So it makes sense to follow someone's advice that, you know, has proven success with right. whatever it is. So business in general, as an example, everyone's got, you know, advice to give. But unless they, you know, are someone that you, you would want to get advice from, then I just like, you know, brush, brush it off and keep going on the path that you're going because you're the one that knows how to run your business best and what's going to work for you. So... Yeah, just a tip of advice for, for anyone, I think, that, you know, because yeah. I've taken advice from people that maybe I shouldn't have taken advice in the past. And then it'd be better to, you know, just have that mindset of like, is this someone that is going to help me in this specific aspect of running a business or my life? And maybe they're really good at giving you advice on like personal things, but maybe not so much how to run a micro business as an example. Yeah, definitely.
<laughs> yeah. So it sounds like cilantro was, was a crop that was a little bit, you're having some challenges with. Do you, generally speaking, like how do you handle pests and disease in your microgreens production? So we, our room is very closed out. There's not much, um, anything that I need to worry about as far as pests. Uh, we did have an incident where we had a, a mouse coming in and they were eating the pea shoots and the sunflowers. Yeah. It's tricky. Uh, I mean, I, I saw it right away and, you know, a couple traps, it fell on the first day. Then we, we you know, we just keep uh, uh, the door closed and we keep sticky traps for roaches. Mm. But there's no pest. Okay. Yeah. I guess that's something that's. That's more common in uh yeah and in, in the south than the north yeah the one time I I bought can you hear that yeah can you hear the the kid or no yeah a little bit yeah a little bit is is the door is your door closed it is, it is but they, oh, they're okay. just like going at it right now hold on yeah it's yeah not. it's not too bad okay. so yeah, I I, mean, I had be- an issue once. It, white fly and mites because we were growing flowers and we bought some from a farm locally and they just like i guess they they went crazy in the environment and they just ate everything not the microgreens the microgreens were fine but the flowers had mites and white fly and i was able to get rid of the white flies but i wasn't able to get rid of the mites so i decided not to buy from anybody just grow them myself start from seed and keep them inside all the way through. So I don't have any issues with, with, with that. Yeah. Okay. And what about disease? Um, there's some disease as far as like the mold, um, but it's mainly cilantro and sometimes the mustard. But no, I don't have issues with disease. Just, you know, you have to buy clean soil, clean your trays. I, I always clean my trays. Uh, we do, I use bleach. The way the way I clean my trays, I, I actually made a machine myself with a pressure cleaning, so it, it looks oh, kind of cool. like the, like the bootstrap. I think I have a video on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we put a rotating disc, and you just pass it through, and it, it cleans. But I don't know, man. I nice. I started soaking my trays in bleach and a little soap, and it just solved the problem. So it okay. It, it's easy to rinse them off than just like scrubbing them and having to like high pressure them. So I just soak them for like 20 minutes in a little bleach. And I use a surfactant called Super Soap. Okay. Which is like a hydroponic. Um, it's used for hydroponics to, so you know, it's like a wetting agent, right? It doesn't pr- produce yeah. foam or anything. Yeah. So that breaks the water tension uh, very nice. And I just, you know, I, 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 it doesn't take me too long just to wash it off. And that's it. But I don't have uh, so other do mold you... problems or anything like that. Okay, that's good to hear. Do you are you still using the tray washer you built, or are you are you just soaking them? Yeah, I'm just soaking and them it. and then just brushing them off with water. It's it's a lot easier. I don't okay. have to plug in the machine. I mean, eventually, I kind of want to do it because there's so many trays already. You know, once you start yeah. stepping into the 100 trays, it's it becomes a lot of work. You know, so if if you're able to do yeah. it somewhat faster, yeah. I'll, I'll use the machine for sure. Yeah, you know, definitely. And and yeah. I, I would love to get a, a, sure. a dirt. You know, the one that that puts the dirt in the in the trays. That'd be like the greatest yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. That that's the next uh, piece of machinery we're, we're going to create after the little green seating machine is like a like a flat filler. So it would be very similar where you have a topper that you put the soil in, and then you just roll it over, and it perfectly fills it and flattens the soil in one step. Yeah. So that, that'll be the next uh, invention that, that we create. Cause like a lot of, like, for example, you have uh, 50 square feet. There's no, like a soil mixing machine can be, uh, you know, six feet by four feet. So you, it would be half of your room, exactly. you know? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> having something that's small and portable, but still does the job, yeah. um, would, I think would, would solve uh, a big, a big current issue uh, and time that a lot of farms have. So um, hopefully, hope, hopefully early next year. That'll be available, Good. but uh, it, we haven't even started working on it yet. So, you know, that's just the next thing we're going to be working on because we see that there's a need for these like automation solutions. So myself and Vertigrow are going to keep creating things as long as people need them and they're going to help people. We're going to create them for the migraines industry, which Good. is pretty cool. Got some ideas for you, yeah. but we'll talk about it later. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> cool. But yeah, tray, tray washer, uh, like it, it, I'm so glad you, you like built one because I think, um, you no, know, it, it's, it's something that is, is eventually most farms when they get, like you said, to that hundred tray plus uh, mark. Uh, you know, and then also you have, I'm guessing you have two sets of trays cause it's actually 200 yeah, because you have, and there's the some, one, the there's one. some that I'm, I'm, I'm not stacking. So I'm, I'm doing two trays plus a tray on the top, you know, so it's so more. Yeah, more. Yeah. So, so it starts adding up that it makes sense to have one. So I still haven't heard of any farms using the bootstrap farmer one, but that might be a good option for farms to, you know, cause not everyone has time to necessarily build one. So if you could just buy out of the box solution that works and, and it cleans your trays, that would be amazing for a lot of farms. Like I would, I would have definitely bought the bootstrap farmer one if I was a farmer. Now we had to like, kind of like you, we had to custom make one and it wasn't cheap. The bootstrap farm one is much, much less expensive than having to custom make one. So for anyone that's interested, that might be a good option. I don't have any feedback yet on it, but it's definitely potentially a good option for cleaning trays. If you don't have the time to build one, if, if you could just like, you know, there's, there's lots of challenges with running a migraines business, but if you could just, wave a magic wand and instantly solve a business challenge you have uh what issue would you want to tr to resolve it and why i think as far as a business challenge uh, it's acquiring customers like really good customer base you know um because it's hard to do everything and then also go out and sell your product um because yeah. you know chefs want samples they they want to be sure that you're not just some crazy guy off the street you know picking this stuff up from you know the grass or something so it yeah that's the hardest part and i think i do need help with that i think that's like my bottleneck you know but that's it and as far as the microgreens i will wave up magic wand and get rid of all the mold <laughs> you know just have perfect seeds all the time because that's also one thing yeah. that people don't know is like you buy you know one lot of seed and then the next one could be bad you know so you're, you're like scratching your head you're like i don't know what's going on because i'm doing the same thing that I was doing last time and it's the seat, you know? So it's, it's, there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff that I could wave a magic wand yeah. if I had, that'd be great. <laughs> so, 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 so for those two things you mentioned, I have, uh, you know, some things that may help. The first with seed is depending on the seed company you're using, uh, you know, there are like, I've had as an example with Johnny's seeds, they are more expensive. Yeah. So a lot of people like haven't even tried them because of that, but I've had maybe one issue in the 10 years I've been buying seed from them. Yeah. So like, you don't have to, you can, you can pay extra to not have those problems, but it's like some people don't necessarily want to spend the money. But for me, I think it's well worth it. Uh, once you get to a certain point, like, yeah, you, you don't want to do I, with I feel like seed is so important. Yeah. yeah. It's not, it's not worth your time at, at a certain point, but the cost difference. And then also like the yield increase by not having those kind of mm -hmm. issues is, is I think quite valuable. And the other thing is with the mold, because you're in such a small space, I think it's, potentially causing like there's so many plants and soil in such a small space that the spore count in the air is probably pretty high yeah. would be my guess. So one, one thing I suggest is you can buy on Amazon, like a UV <coughs> air filter. So it just like filters the air with the UV light and kills anything in the air could make a big difference in stopping the spread of mold in your space. I can't guarantee it will help, but it's, you know, a pretty inexpensive thing to try. We had a really rare disease that we were like the first reported ones in Canada. We bought some seed that had it on it pretty much. And, uh, and then we couldn't get rid of it because there's not much information on how to get rid of it. And the way we were able to get rid of it, or at least eliminate it 95% was putting a UV light air filter in the germination room because it was spreading in there. And then that filtered the air so it had less time to spread. And it made a sig like surprisingly a significant difference. So um, now pythium spreads in water. So if it's pythium you're dealing with, that may not help, but anything else that's, uh, air airborne having a UV air filter can make a pretty big difference. In, yeah. I, I think um, it's pythium, reducing the, the, risk. the one with cilantro, cause it's only cilantro, you know, I don't, I don't have issue with other crops, like, unless it's like mm -hmm. mustard, because there's a type of mustard that I grow that has issues. But normally I get another variety that just ran out. So right now we're like, you know, waiting for it. But um, yeah, I don't have a lot of issues with mold. I, I do have, since like I have a lot of time, but we, t we it compressed everything, right? So we don't have a lot of space, so we compressed everything. We're doing 
32 trades per rack. Is that a normal number? Uh, I feel it's normally 20, so you, you must have more levels, right? Yeah, so right? we're doing 32 trades per rack, and then I have another rack that is 36 trades. So we're doing, wow. we're doing about 7 inches or 8 inches of space between oh, wow. the light and, and the bottom. Not even the trade, just the bottom of, of the other rack. So it's very close. I know the heat uh, affects the crop, and that will create more humidity, and, and you know it's more prone to... to but it's just, since it's a so, so short term, um, I feel like if, if I don't leave it for too long, it, it won't happen. You know, we won't get that decaying. Um, so far, it's working. I know I, it should be different, but I mean, I'm, I'm getting the most out of my space right now. So. If it's working. Yeah. Like, honestly, the, the, if you can get like the more you can get out of the space, as long as you're not minimizing quality is a good thing. Yeah. Like, you know, if, if I were to, to build a farm from scratch, I, I would do it different than I would have done two years ago or five years ago. Like you, you keep learning and you improve the efficiency of your operation. So, you know, you have 96 trays in 50 square feet. Like that's a very high density. And I think it might be the highest density I've heard of because you have seven should inch I, should spacing. I make a you're growing for a, like a record, you know, maybe, or something? <laughs> the most maybe germinated you put that seeds? In your, in your, what? Yeah, in, in the smallest amount of space. There's a lot of life in that room in 50 oh, square yeah. feet. But maybe maybe that's a selling point for applying for grants. Is that like you've created something that is more efficient than what exists elsewhere and you want to continue increasing it? Like if I was someone, like the way I always kind of think of these things is you want to think of in the shoes of uh, the other side. So in this case, if you're applying for grants, what would entice someone to give you more money for grants? It's someone that's doing something very well. So if you can prove that you're doing something uniquely well, uh, and in this case, growing more food in less space, meaning you need less real estate to grow mm -hmm. the food is, you know, I think a, a good thing all around for you, for the people giving you the grant, because that means they're going to be promoting the right things. Yeah. And for people listening that might be like, oh, maybe I should try growing at seven inch spacing and see if I, yeah. I can grow my crops and get the same quality. I hope they do. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we, yeah. we got approached um, by a nonprofit uh, recently, well, a while ago, but then recently they came back to us because um, they're trying to do like a community-based garden. So since they're a nonprofit, they're able to apply for different grants. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. Well, it's still in the talks. It's still in the talks. We'll yeah, that's great. In terms of like you mentioned, acquiring customers was was a was a big uh, challenge that, that that you have. What what specifically do you find uh, in the customer acquisition process is difficult? Because it seems like you've you've done well so far. Um, but I'm just curious on on what is is it like an enjoyment of doing sales, or is it uh, like a certain difficulty in part of the process of getting sales, like time consumption? Yeah, it's probably more along those lines. time consumption and having the right timing. Because if you go into a restaurant that just opened, yeah. the chef is not going to be there. Probably you get you know a back somebody from 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 the front of the house or somebody that has nothing to do with what you're trying to sell. So if you leave a sample or something like that, you might have to come back later or, you know, it's the specifics of it. Like in Miami, everything sometimes opens at six or it opens during the day, but um, during those times it's very slow. So the chefs aren't there. So you have to be there between three and four and driving around Miami during those times is like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's very time consuming. So how many restaurants can I reach going out at three o'clock, you know, when all the kids are going out of school, when everybody's getting out of work, uh, you know, it's, it's hard, but I found time enough yeah. to, to be able to like fill the entire room that I have. So yeah, I mean, you, you, anybody can do it. Anybody can do it. It's not that hard. As long as you, yeah. you know, you have a friendly with, with your customers, um, you tell them you, you're truthful about where the product is coming from and what your goal is as far as like um, where you're bringing this product to them. Like you're, you're trying to find like really fresh product for, for the restaurant and you're very consistent and, you know, your prices are right. You know, you can't, they can't be over the top. You're going to sell. Like it's, it's a no brainer. Like the chefs, they'll, they'll take it. They'll take it. You know, as long as you don't go into yeah. a restaurant where the, the, they're going to like look at you weird. Like I, I, I went to Michelin star restaurants, you know, and, and I offered my product 
And one of the, the Michelin star restaurants that I have, they weren't a Michelin star before uh, we were like, we were selling to them and then they, they got oh, a, a Michelin star, you know? So the, that we sell live, uh, sold trays to them. We sell two a week. And then the other one sell marigolds, marigold microgreens. And they're mm-hmm. like, um, they're very, I guess, Mexican inspired, very Latin. They have a lot of local and they get their, their grains from like a specific places in Mexico. So they're very, they, they use a lot of farms here in Florida. And I think you, you went to, which farm was it that you went to in South Florida? Uh, uh, tiny leaf. Okay. Cause they, they work with tiny farms. Yeah. I don't know if they do microgreens, but they do. Oh, okay. No. Yeah. Yeah. That's a different farm. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it's, yeah. it's about time, you know, you have to put in the time to actually go in the right time, have samples for the chefs and be able to provide value to them, you know? Yeah, no, for sure. I also keep in mind that you've been doing it for a period of time. So it gets easier as yeah. you do it. So like the first sale you try to do, like my first sale I tried to did, what it wasn't, it wasn't successful. It wasn't like, you know, like it takes time. You, you learn what works and you keep doing more of that. So it's something that's like, you can't expect to be perfect on day yeah, one. I mean, I, but it I, sounds like I more than issue. selling microgreens when everything was closed, you know? When people had no customers yeah. uh, during the pandemic. So it was really hard, like going restaurant after restaurant. They were just like, no, you know, like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, so yeah. it, it, it was tough. But then there was like a period of time where it was ending. And then they were so open, like everybody was so open to helping each other out and like, you know, collaborating together that it was easier. You know, nowadays, since everything is back to normal, um, it's a little bit harder to get into the restaurants. Yeah, I would say. Yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, I've, I noticed that as well. There was definitely like a post close boom on the food mm-hmm. service side. Cause I remember like the demand on the restaurant side, like was a lot higher than pre COVID. So it was interesting to see that like everyone was just antsy to be able to go out and go to restaurants again. So more people than average went out and then it kind of leveled off, you know, over, you know, the last few years as, as things have gone back to normal. But uh, yeah, it's, it, there's, you know, the food service industry is always, uh, it's, it's always up and down. It's not like super steady state. So there's times that may be better times that are worse, but as you improve your skill set in selling, you kind of mitigate the, the external factor challenges like the economic climate, or, you know, if, if, if there's any differences in, in demand for products over time, like by being better at sales. So you kind of learn that skill set. You only need to learn it once because once you learn it, you know it. And then make sales a lot easier. But it sounds like the challenge you're having is just like the timing of having, being able to go to actually see the chefs at the right time because you have a family and you have kids that are, you know, in in school and you're trying to run the business and there's so much traffic during that time. So it sounds like it's like a specific challenge that you're facing, but there's obviously ways to overcome that when the time comes. There's Um, are just minimal excuses, but that's kind of what, what, you know, that's what we deal with, you know, on a daily basis. What would you say like is the most time consuming task that you do in your daily operations? So you have like production, you have sales, you have deliveries and stuff. Like what, what's like, is there any specific tasks that really take a long time for you to do right now? Um, I work an average of 20 hours a week on the farm. I guess between seeding and harvesting is the longest that would take harvesting because there's so many trays and I have to, I do them by hand. I, I cut by hand. I use scissors. And then that same day that I harvest, I put out all the trays, but definitely harvesting. If I could get something to harvest quicker, that'd be great. You know? Yeah. I think the quick cut greens harvester will, yeah. <laughs> if you haven't I mean, tried it, just it that, definitely solve that issue The inflation on that quick harvester was like a lot. <laughs> uh, how much is it now? I don't know, but it, it remember it was not that price before. Oh <laughs> uh, well, that's just yeah, I, that, that's a lot of things after COVID. Yeah. But like the way the way I think of it is like how much time oh, are you I spending? I, I definitely it, it's, it's a good investment, yeah. and as far as time, like it's all worth it. But we'll we'll get there. We'll get there little by little. We'll get there. Yeah, definitely. for sure. Before we wrap up if you, if you can go back in time to when you started your farm and meet the younger version of yourself what advice would you give him to set him up for success in the business okay so if i 
if I could go back in time and give myself some advice, I would tell myself to be a little bit more patient. Don't give up on cilantro and try to look for ways to get free money. You know, um, there's a lot of ways that the government can help you here, especially since you're growing food. So that yeah. that's definitely what I would do, you know, because it was my first business. It was my first time opening a company. So there's so many ways of acquiring, you know, I, I wouldn't say getting into debt because it, it becomes a whole nother problem. But there's a lot of help for businesses out there, especially when, when you're starting out and just look for that, you know, look for ways that you can grow your business without adding more debt to yourself. That will be my advice, you know, but I want to reverse the question to you. If you could go back in time to the day you start your farm and meet your younger self, what advice would you give yourself <laughs> to set them up for success? That's a good, I've never, I've never been asked that question. I know, uh, I know. I <laughs> That's why I reversed it. Podcast. I was going to tell you about um, it. I wanted it to be a surprise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm on the spot here. Um, I think there's, there's lots of things. I think, I think the biggest one is um, when I started, I only went to like one customer at a time to get sales. And so pretty much what I would do is I would, I, I, I thought in my head, I'm like, I, I don't want to like get a sale, but then not be able to meet the demand, which, you know, was just a, you know, uh, outdated, uh, you know, or, or immature mindset I had, you know, just coming out of school and, and not really knowing, you know, that I can say no sort of mm -hmm. thing to someone if I don't have the space. So I would go, I would get one, I would go one customer at a time, wait to hear back that they'd say no, and potentially wait up to like two weeks at a time, then go to the next customer and wait two weeks. And it was just this like very slow process. I could have done what I did the first like six months, probably in like two weeks. Mm -hmm. And would have like sped up that initial sales process. That that was something specific to me. Now, in, in in general, what I'd suggest people is like don't reinvent the wheel. Like that that's the simple, uh, like quick set advice is, is you don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's at this point, there's many people that have done it. Not just myself, but tons of other people, including yourself. There's lots of information out there. Uh, so you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You just want to take the tidbits of information that are great from different educators or different farms that you see. So um, as an example, uh, if you want to see what works well on social media for farms, find a farm that's done really well on social media. Find the posts that have gotten a lot of views or a lot of traction and try to analyze that and work backwards on how to create that for yourself. So it's the same thing. If you see a farm that's done, that, you know, has done really well, has scaled up, has, has what you want in your farm. So maybe that's growing in, you know, staying small, but doing it efficiently, or maybe that's having a really large scale farm that, you know, you don't have to do the labor anymore, whatever it may be, find that and, and try to learn from them. So, you know, Alex Ramosi, he has like these videos from, from years ago where he wanted to learn how to do social media advertising. So he went to an agency and paid them like a ridiculous amount of money. Like, I don't even know what it was, some ridiculous amount of money to learn that skill set that normally they can't learn, uh, that he couldn't learn because it's not available in like course, as an example. So you want to seek out the information you're looking for. Um, generally speaking, you have to pay for high quality information. Like you're not going to get like the best information necessarily for free. So part of what I'm doing this podcast is to give good information out for free. But at the same time, you have to like go through, you know, I don't know, now 60 hours of, of podcasts or whatever is, is, is available other than like getting on a call and saying like, hey, how, how can I improve my operation? And you pay someone that knows what they're doing and do it faster. Like, I wish I had that available when I started, but that didn't really exist. Right. So there's many ways to do it. It doesn't have to be like consulting. There's course, there's, you know, there's workshops. There's many different ways to, to learn the information. One way is just do it, try it, and see if it works, but that's going to be much slower. So if you want to speed up your success, then don't reinvent the wheel. Try to find people that have done it and take what they've learned and take that to the next level. And that's how the next generation of farms will be much better than my generation of farms that only could get to a certain point because of the fact that like we had to do everything ourselves. There wasn't as much education on how to scale it up, automate, etc. cetera. So that's, a, that's the, the simple... Uh, answer that was uh, a little bit longer than I expected. Hey, but would you buy um, a, a microgreens farm? It would be a lot easier to buy one and then and then operate it because of what I've learned. I feel that the way I think of it now is unless I can buy a microgreens farm 
and then like like scale it so that it has a bigger impact than what I'm doing now, it wouldn't make sense for me to buy one. So it, it would only be like if I see a way to have like a farm, like a model that has like a farm in every you know major city in the U.S. and Canada, as an example, and it's all run on the same system. Uh, that now that makes sense because you get a lot of economies of scale and you can have a big impact across North America. The reason I'm doing the education side is because I can take what I've learned, share it with people, and have them uh, uh, replicate it. And I could do that with much much more efficiency and time uh, than if I wanted to make each farm myself. Yeah. So it's a more efficient method of me um, making change for the positive in like the industry. Franchise. You. you yeah, it's hard to say. There hasn't been a, a, a franchise model in microgreens farming that has worked yet, but I hope that that happens because I think that would be really cool. There's a lot of people that talk about it, but I haven't seen it happen yet. So until it actually happens and there's a proven model that it can work, it might be more complicated than it appears at first. And it, yeah, so it just, it, but, but that's the way I would consider getting back into growing commercially would be to have something that's really scalable that can like be transferred easily so pretty much which which is kind of what i'm starting to do which is gather all the information condense it into the most valuable stuff and put it out there and then if farms if farms can use that information to replicate another farm and have success then there's a much easier way to move that to a franchise model than uh, than just like trying that from scratch so it's kind of like an iteration step towards that whether i do that or not i have no idea We'll see. The, fu- the, the future is very unknown. I just go with the flow with these kind of things. All right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, uh, this has been amazing. I think there's there's a lot of great insight. I think it was really cool how dense your farm is uh, at the scale that you have it at. I think that's something really unique that um, I think is really, really cool. If listeners want to connect more with you and learn more about your farm, where can they find you online and on social they media? They can go to my Facebook page, uh, Charges Microgreens, or the Instagram. And just, you know, send me a DM. I'm open book. Thanks so much for coming on, Charlie. It was a great, great episode. And uh, yeah, thank you, Jonah, for having me. Appreciate it. It was fun. Thanks for tuning in to the Microgreens Mastery Podcast. To access a wealth of insights, just click the subscribe button, stay notified about each new episode, and enjoy all of this wisdom for free. If you're ready to supercharge your microgreens business, visit microgreensconsulting.com for a gold mine of guides and resources. We've transformed thousands of microgreens businesses and you're invited to join the success story. Let's stay connected. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at Microgreens Consulting for exclusive content and expert tips and wisdom. If you found this episode insightful, please leave us a review, spread the word, and let's share microgreens magic with the world. Until next time, let curiosity fuel your growth and may happiness be your harvest. Happy growing, everyone.